Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here on this panel at the Hausa International Book and Arts Festival. Uh, in this panel, we'll be discussing language and identity in Hausa Kiswahili uh, literature. Uh, and of course, it's not just me here on the panel, it's not a lecture. Um, it's, it's a panel that comprises four people who, between them, know quite a bit about both Hausa culture and literature, and of course, Swahili culture and literature. Uh, on the panel is Doslin Kiguru, who is a researcher with an interest in literary texts and their production mechanisms. Her research engages with cultural and literary production in Africa with a focus on different literary platforms such as publishing and prize industries, book fairs, and uh, similar very interesting things, none of which I have won. Uh, also on the panel is Professor Dr. Abdallah Ubadamu, who is a household name in Nigeria, um, who holds double professorships in science education and in media and cultural communication uh, from the Bayer University, Kano. He's domiciled at the Department of Information and Media Studies at the Faculty of Communication at the Bayer University, Kano, and has served as Vice Chancellor of the National Open University of Nigeria. Moses Kilolo is a founding member of, the, of Jalada Africa, um, who is, he is one of my predecessors as I'm currently the managing editor. Um, he was managing editor between 2014 and 2018, and he has managed the Mabati Cornell Kiswahili Prize uh, for African Literature. Moses' writing has been published in Saraba Magazine and elsewhere. And my name, of course, is Richard Ali. So uh, let's get into the meat of the matter. Before we get to the literature, we have to talk about the people. So it's about two sets of people who have, who between them comprise some of the, the largest languages, African languages out there. The Hausa people of Western, of, um, of West Africa and the Swahili people of coastal East Africa. So perhaps we should start with the Swahili people. Um, Moses, you have a, you have run a, a Swahili prize, so you should know a bit about that. So tell us a little bit about the Swahili people uh, and their origins, and uh, and then we can kick it off from there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Richard. So um, I don't know what to really say about the Swahili people because uh, the people who speak Swahili are. Uh, um very wide in terms of um their their spread and we really don't have um a particular ethnic um composition that we say is Swahili. we have the original Swahili people but we have um a multiplicity of people that speak the Swahili language across uh east africa and now uh, the language is starting to spread um, in Southern Africa and other parts of the continent. So in many ways, we could say that the people who are speaking Swahili today are non-ethnic and they possess uh, what I would call a pan-African character in, in nature. And um, the language itself um, has its origins, of course, in, in the East Africa coast from... Um, from the Kenyan coast to the Tanzanian coast, spreading all the way to the Mozambique coast, and now um, <clears throat> and and now it's it's as I've said, it's started to spread in very many other Eastern Africa and and um, Southern Africa countries, and recently we've had the language being um, named as one of the you know the official AU languages, and the UN has recognized this language. So the people themselves in their complexity um, and in the ways in which um, they, they have, they, the, the language has grown, um, can trace, of course, its origins to the um, influences of, the, of the, um, the local languages that were spoken in the East African coast and, um, and the, Arab, the, Arab, the Arabic language that was brought in by the traders in, in, in the early 15th, 14th century and since then the language has continued to grow and um, the, the people in the coast uh, have, I, have adopted this as their, 
is their mother tongue. And we have seen um, in Kenya, this language was adopted as one of the official languages, uh, meaning that in addition to English, uh, most of the people uh, grow up speaking this language. So while in a sense, they might not be identifying as, um, as Swahili, um, as Kenyans, majority of uh, Kenyans might not identify as Swahili people. They, they do have access and speak this language as one of the official languages in the country. But if you look at Tanzania, it's a bit different in that the people uh, across the country use this language a lot more. Um, it used as a language of instruction in schools and it's used as one of the um, uh, languages in official, it's actually the main language in official languages. So in, in official uh, uh, purposes, you know, in government, in, in, um, in important meetings and all that. Um, and therefore, for, for Tanzania and Kenya, it's a bit different, but you can see that Swahili is one of the most important uh, languages that's spoken there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Moses. Um, one of the interesting things I've taken from your submission is the idea of the supranationality um, of the Swahili language. So it makes sense to move on to the other end of the table and um, ask uh, Professor Ubabdalla um, about this. I remember when I was an undergraduate at Zaria, you know, and um, the, the, the Hausa, Hausa land particularly is thought of in terms of Kasar Hausa, uh, a, a land of the Hausa speakers. So does this also speak to supranationality um, <clears throat> in the same sense that uh, that Moses Kilolo has spoken about Swahili, you know, uh, or is it a particularly distinct um, um, form of cultural evolution? Uh, which, which uh, could you wear on that, Prof? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much for that. There is a slight difference between what uh, Moses just said about Swahili and what, what the Hausa situation is all about. Uh, Hausa is made up of distinct people, human beings, anthropological entities that are called Hausa, just like you have Yoruba, you have Igbo, just like you have Welsh, you have Germans. They, they, they are, there is a group of people called the Hausa. Uh, but there's a lot of debate about whether Hausa is a group of people or they're just simply a language. But the fact that Hausa language is corrosive, that is, it, 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 it takes over all the other communities it comes in contact with. People tend to believe that anybody who can speak the language is Hausa. And part of the political narrative here in northern Nigeria is that all people in the north of Nigeria are referred to as Hausa, even though there are a lot of people who are not indigenous Hausa. But there is a Hausa identity, there is a Hausa group of people, and they have their own states. And these states were derived from ancient history. For instance, they have uh, seven Hausa states, uh, Hausa Bokwe, they call them Hausa Bokwe and uh, Banda Bokwe. And uh, if you are not a citizen of any of these seven Hausa states, then you are not a Hausa. You can speak Hausa language, but you are not Hausa. Just like uh, uh, British. I mean, we all speak English language, but we're not English. We're not British. So if you pick up somebody who, who, who migrates from, from, let's say, Pakistan to Wales, and he could speak uh, Welsh language. That doesn't make him Welsh. He's still Pakistani. So this, this is the same issue. It's not just a question of being able to speak a particular language that gives you identity of that language. You have to have your own individual identity for you to identify yourself with a particular language. There is no way an English man can consider himself house simply because you could speak the language. So just being able to speak a language does not necessarily divorce, uh, di divorce you from your own intrinsic identity or being what you are. So for house language, there is a distinct group of people called Hausa people. And this distinct group of people called Hausa people are located in distinct areas of Hausa land. And all of these areas are now called Hausa land in the no core northern Nigeria. There is uh, Daura, there is Katina, there is Gobir, <clears throat> there is Kano, there is Renu, there is uh, uh, Birom, and then there is Zaria, seven of them. These are the states where Hausa people are found. Of course, from these states, Hausa people migrated outside, and therefore now you have Hausa people in all over uh, West Africa, Togo, Ghana, uh, Dahomey, and all those places. And then down uh, uh, Southern Africa, like uh, the Congos, 
uh, Chad and all the other places. Uh, these are the same dispersal mechanism, migratory mechanism. These, these are the same people who migrated to other places and, 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 and they speak different variations of Hausa language because they come in contact with other languages and cultures and therefore their accent and uh, their variation tend to be different from the one in Kanu or in the main Hausa state. So to answer the question of identity, yes, there is a distinct identity called Hausa. There is a person called Hausa and that person occupies an ancestral land that 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 was identified with him as evolutionary to his existence ethnographically uh thank you very much uh prof i think i i like the way the conversation is is beginning to shape itself so um i, I definitely would move to Doslin kiguru now and uh my, my question or my teaser here is the question of languages of power in, in the sense that um from the conversation so far with prof and uh and, and with um, Moses, there's the sense that these are languages that for some reason um, uh, are adapted by several people, all right? Several people who are not necessarily ethnically from that language, but uh, this language has become adopted by these people. So there is the question that perhaps similar to English or German or whichever um, Western language has become imposed in Africa, that uh, Hausa and Swahili are perhaps languages of power in West Africa and East Africa. From your background as a, as a researcher, Doslin, um, what, 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 what would you like to add to that or disagree or digress, you know, um, with, with this idea of power and these two languages of, of interest to us? Uh, thank you, Richard. I think I would start by talking uh, or insisting on the fact that languages carry with them cultures and the histories of those cultures are carried through these languages over different historical periods. And giving the specific example of Kiswahili, as Munyao started, like um, there are so many ways in which we can analyze Kiswahili as a language spoken along the Eastern African, all the way to the Southern African coastline. And one of, one of the ways, uh, one of the theories that have been put forward is that Kiswahili is a language that developed because of the interaction between Arab traders and the local Bantu speakers along the East African coastlines. That's just one theory, but the theory is currently being debunked in a kind of a decolonization movement to argue that Swahili language has always existed. And what Swahili language did, as, as so many other languages do, is to try and adopt um, foreign words. And in Kiswahili, today we call that Utohozi, for example, taking an English word and making it um, Swahilinizing it. So that's another aspect to look at uh, language and decolonization, and that is in the last few centuries. But today, when you look at Kiswahili and how it's spoken along uh, East Africa and Central Africa, there are so many things we can say about it. First of all is that in Kenya, for example, it's a lingua franca probably even in uh, other, other countries in the region. And when we're talking about lingua francas, it means that we start talking about language and the position that language occupies in society, and especially in a very hierarchical manner. For example, when you're talking about national languages that are spoken in Kenya, we all know that English has, occupies a higher position in that hierarchy, then Kiswahili comes next, and then all the other languages that are spoken in the country probably not the same, at the same level, but that hierarchy is maintained. So the question, when you're looking at Kiswahili and how Kiswahili is used as a tool of literary and cultural production, and as Mnyo has, has, has said before, different countries, different regions will have different um, experiences of how that language and power work. For example, speaking with some Ugandans, in the context of Kiswahili, they would argue that for them, Kiswahili is a language of violence. It's a military language because it, it, it was used a lot by the military during the Idi Amini period. And I remember doing some research about this and having respondents that would say things like, the only thing, the only words that they know in Kiswahili are words like, fungwa mlango, toka inje. And that's, that's a very violent, the direct translation to that would be like open the door get outside and things like that so these are words that were memorized during that uh, violence historical period 
but that has been used as a kind of like definition of what Kiswahili means to this specific group of people. When you go to Tanzania, the whole the political aspect of uh, where Kiswahili uh, features in terms of um, of language, it it features very highly. So that would be another different experience to it. You move away to Rwanda, who are now adopting Kiswahili and Burundi, the experiences would be different. So in as much as we want to talk about uh, a language uh, like Kiswahili and power, it's also not OK to look at it like in a blanket way, like it's, uh, it, um, it's, it's not a blanket way to look at language and power all through all these different countries. And even when we go deeper into different like regions, you realize that it, um, Kiswahili as a language also serves different reasons. Last year, was it last year or early this year when uh, Munyao and I were doing some, uh, some work, uh, the Kenyan cause? And then we started talking about the whole idea of um, dialects, the Kiswahili dialects, because you can't speak about Kiswahili as only one language. It exists in dialects. dialects. But then when we are using the word dialect, it means that there is an official one, and then there are others that are less than. So there are so many, all these ways in which that we, in so many ways in which we can analyze language and power, and even just using a language as simple as Kiswahili. So one of the ways in which uh, that helps me um, analyze that is to look at regions, like not to put everything in a blanket. I don't know if that answers in, like in a kind of roundabout way about language and power. It is definitely helpful. I, I can say that, if, or if I say so myself. So um, I think that the, the conversation is moving on in a very organic manner. So I'd move back to Professor Abdullah. Um, I'll pick up on something you said, which was that Hausa is a very corrosive uh, language, which I thought was very, very fascinating. Um, I'd like you to expand that, expatiate on that a bit, and uh, particularly in, 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 you know, how is it a corrosive language? And is this particularly a good thing? Okay, uh, the, the Hausa as a group normally prefer their language, of course, just like any other group. But they, they, they refuse to, to, act to, you know, to abandon their language because they tie down their language to their identity. So as a result of that, when they come in contact with other non house groups, they pick up their vocabularies, modify these vocabularies, uh, and, and, and then transmutate them as their own, such that the original speaker of a particular language will not even understand the vocabulary that has been borrowed from their own language into Hausa language. A lot of the vocabularies in Hausa language were borrowed from other cultures, but they have been absorbed. That's why I call it corrosive. It, it, when it meets other language, it picks up those uh, uh, concepts and then just simply converts them into its own native uh, uh, format and gives it its own distinct Hausa identity. Uh, let, let, let me give you an example. Uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, Agwagwa. Agwagwa is a duck. In, in, in Hausa language, but it's not really a Hausa word. It is taken from Nufi. Uh, the same thing with Agogo, which is a Yoruba word for a watch. And now it is a Hausa word. Uh, same thing with Panu, you know, that is a bowl. Panu, P-A-N-O, is, is a Yoruba word, but now it is it is a Hausa word. And there are so many of them. And let's not even talk about Arabic, because about over 40% of the Hausa vocabulary is made up of Arabic words because of Islam. The, the Hausa have been in contact with Islam since about uh, 13th century. So they, 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 they have adopted a lot of the vocabularies of uh, uh, the, the Quran, uh, therefore subsequently Arabic, into their own corpus of vocabulary. But interestingly enough, they, like I said, they also absorb other languages to such an extent that there are many, many language groups like in, in Yobe state and uh, Borno state and all the other places where the native language has been abandoned and Hausa became a lingua franca for these people. And that, of course, creates his own resentment in the sense that a person cannot communicate with his own parents in their own native language, but they can communicate in Hausa language. That is why I mean by the corrosivity of Hausa language. It eats up the local languages, just, just simply eat them away and substitute it with the, with, the, with the house language. And that, of course, creates this situation of imbalance of power and authority and, of course, resentment. 
so people tend to be res uh, resentful of the fact that they have lost their own language. And the house are saying, hey, I didn't ask you to abandon your language. You decided to abandon it and pick up my own language. That's your own problem, not my problem. Uh, and all I know is that I will not accept your language. And even if I pick up your language, I will transmutate your language into my uh, lexicon so that you can pick up a Yoruba word, an Igbo word, and whatever word from any other place, and then transmutate it into Hausa word. Uh, and therefore, they have taken it away and colonized the language, as it were. They, they colonized the languages without really being conscious about what they have been doing. There is this famous saying, I don't know how true it is, that Sheikh Usman Damfudio, the, the jihadist uh, of uh, no Hello. Uh, it was getting interesting, and Prof has dialed off. <laughs> oh, he's back. Okay, he's, he's back. back. He's, no, he's back. back. Yeah. Hello, Prof. Uh, I think he's trying to dial in again. So let's hope he's able. That's one of the problems, you know, with uh, Africa, isn't it? Internet access and issues like that. So um, while we wait for the professor to dial in, I'll go back to you, uh, Munyao, on the issue of um, dialects particularly. I intend to take up the professor on that as well. Uh, the issue of dialects. Ah, OK. Hello, professor. Am I back? Yes. Yes, you're back. It would seem okay. that Shehu and Fodio objected right. to what you were right. about to say. <laughs> there, was this, there was this anecdote, I don't know what it was, that Shehu and Fodio was claimed to have said, we have conquered the Hausa state. We have taken over their, their, their leadership, but they have conquered us with their language. Okay, is it me? And the, the end product is that you will now have a person who is a Pulani, like me. I'm Pulani, ethnically Pulani. But I don't speak the language. I only speak how the language. So you you have a whole vast territory of Pulani people who look like Pulani, but they don't speak a single word of the Pulani language. They only speak Hausa language. So that is what I mean by the corrosive nature of of Hausa language. It has, those who live in so-called minority areas of northern Nigeria, like in Plateau State and Yobe State, would know that their languages have been have been wiped off the face of the earth by Hausa language. So Hausa language is, is corrosive in the sense that it just simply eats other languages, uh, just like that. So the challenge is for the speakers of other so-called minority languages to do something about uh, boosting up their, their own language capabilities and capacity in order to keep them alive, like their folk tales, their tradition, their music, their films and everything, so that they can now maintain the conversation about the validity of their language for those upcoming generations. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor. But before I let you go, um, I'm definitely going to take you up on the issue of dialects. You know, I uh -huh. remember um, a few decades ago, there were dialects of Hausa beyond something like Sakwachanchi, Kananchi, of course, and the rest. There was, for mm. example, a Barikanchi, which was particularly spoken in military barracks and, and mm. things like that. Um, just mm. so that our our participants would get a, a 360 view of the language in terms of mm. its variety. Mm. Could you speak a little bit about the dialects of the Hausa language and what makes them distinct? Okay, the beauty of mass media and mass communication is that all the, the radio stations outside uh, Africa that broadcast the language have uh, accepted that the Hausa of Kanu is the standard Hausa. I mean, of course, scholars will tell you that the best Hausa is uh, 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 Sokoto Hausa, and people from Kanu will tell you, no, it is not, because they have a lot of other linguistic interferences. But the commercial language is that of Hausa language, I mean, of that of Kanu. And uh, you have all these Chinese, uh, Germans, uh, British, Americans, uh, Russian. Everybody has defaulted to the Hausa of Kanu as the standard Hausa. So yes, there are maybe Sokotanchi and Katananchi and all these so-called minor, minor variations. Uh, but I can tell you this, Richard, those variations are going away with the TikTok generation. That TikTok generation, the Snapchat generation, <laughs> they're not interested in all these quaint subpotenti or quaint katananchi. They are freaking urban internet language, urban language that has been created on the internet by a TikTok, by a Snapchat, by, a, by a, you know, all sorts of things, urban urbanization. 
So yes, uh, uh, there are dialects, <laughs> but those dialects are, are really slowly, slowly fading away, giving way to Generation Z because they are more communicative than anybody else. Anybody who's over fifty, they don't bother with all this uh, internet, with Facebook, and all that. Kids that are between like thirteen to twenty-five, those are the dangerous generation. Those are the generation <laughs> Z. Those are the generation that are creating new narratives, new words, new perceptions of Hausa language. And I don't think it is only restricted to, to, to Hausa regions alone. I'm pretty sure there is a lot of uh, such infusion of uh, internet ideology or internet vocabulary in Swahili uh, and other parts of, of Africa. So we're all getting into the internet cyber language uh, kind of thing. And the sooner we agree and face it and deal with it, the better for us. We can continue talking about quaint old language. I mean, Kids now don't even understand some of the old vocabularies of the like uh, akushi. Akushi means a bowl, a wooden bowl. But hey, they're real. Who's going to eat in a wooden bowl now? You have ceramic bowls, okay? <laughs> you have, uh, <laughs> so why, why would a kid just keep thinking about a ceramic bowl when he doesn't even see it? They don't even produce it. It's historical, quite okay. Yeah, put it in the museum and then label it so that I can see it and remember <laughs> what they have been using years ago. But now there's a bowl. So using the language, using all these intangible objects, uh, tangible objects, it does not deter from the fundamental root of identity of me as a person, as a house of person, as, as a, a believer in house of culture and identity. But I can use all these modern things like that. Okay, people eat with their hands. Hello, why would I eat with my hand? It's dirt, a lot of bacteria all over the place. Even if I wash my hands, I'm not going to eat with my hand. There is a spoon, there is a fork, there is a knife. <laughs> Eating with a knife, spoon, and fork does not make me English. It just simply me making me a healthy person. I'm worried about my health. I'm not going to put them in my hand in a, in, a, in a, what is it? All this uh, local food and then start, oh, no, hey, no way, no way, no way. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm an Englishman. I just care about my health. And I don't like the idea of having to wash my hands. I'm more about while I'm eating, I like to play with my iPhone. I like to play with my iPad. And uh, you, you can't do that when you have all this gooey uh, soup running all over the damn place, getting inside your keyboard and all that. <laughs> so we, we, we need to negotiate intangible cultural heritage and tangible cultural heritage and culture and identity and language. And I think the Generation Z are leading the way. The sooner we listen to them the better. So hi, Generation Z. I love you guys. You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was quite uh, quite an explosive submission. So we'll definitely move on to, to Moses. So Moses, I'm not going to ask you a question. Could you respond to Prof's um, arguments and his fundamental points, which have been various as they have been interesting from the perspective of the Swahili culture and the Swahili language? Uh, definitely the use of the uh, Swahili language among uh, the young people is uh, has been you know affected in various ways uh, for example in Nairobi and I think we might speak um, we, we might speak also about the urban Creoles uh, such as uh, like uh, Sheng for instance uh, that has has uh, grown from um, from, from the usage of Swahili in the urban setting, but also been influenced so much by the other languages that are spoken in places like Nairobi. Um, and, and, and this is a language that has grown to become uh, something of its own that is being used by the youth. Uh, and and they, they tend to take a lot from, uh, from, you know, both the local languages, but also English and largely Kiswahili, in order to create this kind of urban um, urban Creole that's uh, that's called Sheng. And there's so many conversations about um, whether this is actually a language or it's a deformation of Kiswahili as, as a language, and whether increased uh, and, and whether we should increasingly encourage young people to use it or to or abandon it, but. Um, because of the way it's used in different settings um, and, and, and the annoyance that it gives to people who are strict about the rules of language and Kiswahili is, is, is a lingua franca in the region. 
um, it, it keeps growing and it's, it's different in the different areas where it's spoken. But going back to um, what Professor was talking about, uh, talking about dialects and what is actually the, um, the, the main dialect in, the, in any of the languages is that Kiswahili itself has so many dialects. Um, and because like we were saying earlier, Kiswahili extends from as I up as Lamu in Kenya and goes to as many countries all the way and uh, to the Southern Africa, we have more than 15 dialects that are spoken across that whole region. But um, uh, it's, most it's people will talk it. about three main dialects. Um, the first one being uh, the one that is spoken in Zanzibar, <laughs> Uh, it's called Kiunguja, uh, and there's then the dialect that's spoken in Mombasa, which is called Kimvita, and the dialect that's spoken in Lamu that is called Ki Kiamu, I, th I think. And um, in conversations about what is actually the main dialect or which it can be referred to as the standard dialect for the Kiswahili speakers, uh, a lot of people tend to... Um, tend to see the Kiunguja uh, dialect. And I, and I think Dusleen might also uh, speak to this, but I think uh, the, the dialect that is seen as the standard uh, dialect for Kiswahili is usually the Kiunguja one, the one is, that is spoken in Zanzibar. And also because of the way the language itself tends as, as tended to grow and be influenced by other uh, languages across the region, you will find that it's 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 very difficult sometimes to get um, uh, what, especially for people who have not grown up with Kiswahili as their main language, it might be difficult to understand um, what people are saying in different regions. I remember like in 2017 when we went for uh, a, a, a tour across East Africa, um, interacting with the different uh, local languages uh, and and um, <clears throat> and the way and the way people were producing literature in those languages we were in Congo and the kind of Swahili that was being spoken there was quite difficult for us to actually understand because of the influence of of both uh, French and the, and, and the and the languages there so you can see the manner in which um, not just dialects but the influence of other languages within the regions that Kiswahili is being spoken tends to have an impact on what actually becomes the Kiswahili that's being spoken in the various areas. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, um, Doslin, um, you, you've got quite a bit uh, to, 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 to speak to, you know, both from the perspective of um, dialects, which uh, Moses has thrown that hot potato, um, to you, but also because of your work as a researcher, you, 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 I would also love your response to um, Professor's point on the Gen Z and this interesting things that they are doing with languages, at least with the Hausa language. Is it a similar situation with Swahili and what does this portend? You know, are we going back to some sort of Babel or an anti-Babel? What, what, what does this uh, portend? Where are we going in terms of language? particularly with reference to Swahili, and of course we can extrapolate to the Hausa language. Okay, thanks. Uh, what I can say about that, starting with the professor's words and, and Kilolos, is that there is a body that regulates Kiswahili as a language in East Africa. So this is like um, the body that actually I forget what the name is. Kilolo, I'm sure you know it. I was trying to look for it in my notes. So this is a body that regulates uh, what is contained within the language. It's the body that regulates all the new words coming in. And this body functions in very different ways. And I, I, for example, in today's world, it helps us, for example, when you're talking about Kiswahili as a language of instruction, of like a language uh, of science and things like that. It's a body that regulates new words because languages keep growing. And that's a fact of life. It's kind of part of evolution because if we live 70 years ago, we didn't have a, a word for computer, but now we do, even in other foreign languages, meaning that even languages that did not produce, like the, the word computer was not first, um, mentioned in Kiswahili language, it means that later 
these languages are going to expand and include all these new words that are coming in. And then the other thing that I want to talk about is the, the language, languages that exist in between, like Sheng as a Creole language, that usually uses most of the words uh, used in Sheng come from Kiswahili, and then you add English and other languages that are mostly spoken uh, around um, urban centers in Kenya. But the main language for Sheng is Kiswahili. So I kind of uh, look at Sheng not as a, another Kiswahili or another um, form of Kiswahili that is kind of watered down, but I want to look at Sheng as another language altogether that is able to accommodate all these new languages, all these new words borrowed from different languages, borrowed from technology like social media, TikTok, and things like that. It's able to borrow these words use them, incorporate them into the language without necessarily going through a body that vets new languages or new words in a language. And that is the good thing about a language that exists in the middle, in the cracks, like Shen, because it does not have to be regulated by a body, whether government or not. And also it means that it's faster to take up new words or to lose words. And remember, a language like Shen exists in society as a kind of a counterculture. It's against the normative culture. So of course, you're not going to control the new words that are coming in, but communication is happening. And what you'll find with a language like Sheng is that it keeps evolving very quickly. But because of that easy, easy and fast evolution process, it means that you can be, it can, it's able to capture moments in history very well. Like the Sheng that used to be spoken in the 2010s is not the same Sheng that is spoken today. The Sheng that is spoken in the Eastlands part of Nairobi is not the same Sheng that is spoken, for example, in Kisumu. There are all these different ways in, in which that language exists. But the best thing about it is that it's able to capture that particular moment in history, sometimes even that particular moment in geography. And I would say that that's the main two differences between Kiswahili and Sheng. And I don't, I don't think it would be a good idea to look at Sheng as watered down Kiswahili. Just look at it as another language that is existing along Kiswahili. Uh, can, okay. I put in here? Can, I, can I okay. put in and write that to her? Briefly. I, yeah, briefly. I, think I, like, I like her perception that we should not look at it as a watered down language. Language is evolutionary. It's, it's not yep. stationary. It's dynamic. Yeah. What is, what is stationary is our identity, the sense of belonging. I, I am I, I am who I am. Just because I speak good English doesn't make me English. Or because I speak American variety doesn't make me an American. But it, we, we need to look at the fact that languages will always come in contact with other words and vocabularies and therefore <coughs> evolve. You know, they, they are ec ecological. They, they keep evolving into new forms. Even English itself didn't, I mean, English right now is a corrupt form. The original language of English is Latin. But when other words keep coming into English language, now it's transformed into something else. A lot of the words in English language are not even English. They are from other cultures, like girl, beer, mansion. I don't give a damn. These, these are all words taken from other, other places. So I, I think I like her idea that we should not look at language that has a lot of borrowing from other languages that has been watered down, but as a state in evolution, evolution of language. Thank you very much. Um, uh, perhaps one of well, what is more telling about this than both the word different and the word language are both not English words. So when we say English, it came from a different language. I mean, even in the words different and language, they are not English words. Yeah, so I uh, think we're going to Richard, shift. Sorry, sorry to put in again. Richard, I have a paper that I delivered some time ago called The Intangible Immigrant about how language travels from one community to another. I can share it uh, if, if anybody is interested at auadamu at yahoo.com. Send me an email, auadamu at yahoo.com, and I'll, I'll send it to you. And you can see the dynamism of both not only house language, but also other languages, particularly English languages. But I was looking at language as an immigrant, as an intangible immigrant, how to move from one location to another and, and adapt. auadamu at yahoo.com, and I'll send it to you. Okay, well, I'll definitely take you up on that. So let's shift gears a bit now and uh, and speak about the literature aspect, which is, of course, what is of interest to to me. Um, you know, as 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 a writer and uh, somebody who is interested in publishing and all of that. So, what is the terrain of um of literature in Swahili 
uh, from uh, from uh, that's from the East African experience. Uh, perhaps uh, Moses, you take so perhaps Munyao, uh, would you take uh, that up? Um, in uh, if I can give the example, for example, of, of Hausa, where Hausa is written in two different scripts. Is this the case in Swahili? Uh, how many people have been writing? Is it poetry? Is it an emphasis? The novel, for example, is a very, very alien um, form in West Africa, and particularly in Hausa. So perhaps you could give us a little bit of um, um, a background on literature from the Swahili aspect, Munyao. Um. Um, I think I think Swahili has a very uh, well established literary tradition and uh, goes back to um, you know decades um, and and probably you know many many years um, where people have been publishing in Kiswahili and especially translating work um, from other languages into Kiswahili. So we wouldn't say uh, that Kiswahili has not you know is, is a language has not been engaging in literature um uh as compared to other african languages um in in especially in east africa and um currently we have uh, kiswahili is probably one of the other than english kiswahili is the other language where we are seeing very many people um working in uh in in that to produce literature uh both both in poetry and in fiction and um we also have publishers that tend to to uh, lean so much on publishing kiswahili texts um in addition to to english um in, in addition to english texts uh and there isn't as much emphasis on other uh, languages that are native to to East Africa, and um, one of one of the most popular publishers in East Africa that is publishing uh, fic uh, fiction and poetry in Kiswahili is um, Koki Nanyota, who um, have been producing a lot of work that is coming outside of Tanzania and also other writers that are are, are working in um, in you know in the East Africa region. But also, to uh, it's been an observation that a lot of the publishers there are, are trying to to uh, to uh, you know publish work that is geared more towards um, school um, if, if that that is more geared towards using schools and mostly because of the commercial and and value of that kind of publishing and distribution of of literature. So while the, while the literature has had an established literary tradition for a long time, we also see that um, it, it tends to, you know, it, it tends to, uh, for most of the publishers, they tend to work towards um, ensuring that they're publishing works that go to, um, to schools. But to counter this, uh, a lot of people are thinking around ways to encourage uh, the writers that are working in Kiswahili and producing uh, producing poetry and fiction. And so that is how we come uh, with literary prizes that have been, you know, um, have, have been awarded over the past few years. We have uh, literary prizes like the um, Jomo Kenyatta uh, Prize. We have we have. Uh, or, or same prize in Tanzania, and then we have the Kisoili Prize that we have been awarding for the last seven or so years. And this kind of literary prizes go on to uh, encourage more uh, people to write. And every year we see, you know, a couple of hundred people, uh, you know, submitting their works, meaning that currently we have a lot of uh, people that are actually writing uh, and trying to publish in in the language, and this continues to increase the literary output in Kiswahili, and also the distribution of this work uh, works in Kiswahili. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Munyao. Uh, so, Doslin, um, I'm particularly interested from your uh, strength, uh, particularly in the Swahili language. Um, what are, are there any particular um, prevailing? 
uh, thematic concerns in Swahili literature, in Swahili poetry, in Swahili fiction, for example. Um, you know, what, what are those things that we that, that that tend to stand out when we speak about Swahili uh, literature? And uh, perhaps, of course, you could also mention um, the producers of these literature that, that, that you're referring to, writers, um, you know, poets and all of that. Thank you. Um, when, when we talk about publishing, especially in the Kenyan scene or the East African scene and looking at publishing from that wider angle, you realize that publishing is very much linked to the economics of it. And then that is linked to the school systems so that most of the novels that would be published through uh, the local publishing uh, publishing presses would be geared towards school um, school texts, like texts that are read in school, in high schools, in the analysis, uh, literary analysis, which we call Fasihi. So there's that one aspect in which the thematic context that we find people that are geared towards the school textbooks would be very much the thematic context that fit within the youth, like teenagers and things like that. But there have also been a lot of work, and I have to commend people that are working on literary prizes in the region. There has been a lot, recently a lot of work that is being done or being produced, literary works that are being produced that are not necessarily designed for schools and are designed to be consumed by adults outside of the teenage, uh, teenage ages and things like that. So there is that. And we cannot talk about publishing in Kenya or in the region in whatever language without looking at the economics of it. The other thing to look at in that context is that um, there is a lot of publishing that is happening outside of the mainstream. And you look at uh, smaller presses, you look at um, literary organizations and journals and things like that. But most of the work that is being produced outside of the mainstream will be shorter works of fiction. And if we speak about Kiswahili in general, uh, this is where groups like Jalada's work comes in, uh, people like uh, Kwani comes in. And then you find that because they are operating outside of the mainstream, it means that they can be experimental with the way the work is produced, such that even if it's a short story, it's supposedly written in Kiswahili, because it's not meant, for example, as a school textbook. They can experiment with Kiswahili as a language on so many different levels. And that's a good thing because it actually reflects the kind of Kiswahili that is spoken in the, in the, in the region, kind of a, a literature that's very much like echoing what's already happening. So for that reason, I want to commend like people that operate outside of the literary publishing, um, the mainstream literary publishing industries in Kenya, because they are able to experiment with the language in that way, because they are not confined within the economics or the politics of school textbooks and things like that. And what was the other question, Richard, you asked? Um, I think you've, you've given quite a thorough um, response on, 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 on those issues. So thank you very much, Doslin. Um, we'll move now to um, Professor Abdallah, uh, particularly the issue of Hausa language production, literary production. Um, you know, it's been something I'm interested in, and there has been a lot of controversy. You know, the question of a script, the question of orthography, the question of censorship. You remember a few years ago, we got into mm -hmm. uh, an, an issues with Rabu Abdul Karim, who was Director General of the Kano Censorship Board. So, you know, um, could, could you give us a bit of, of from your background um, with how Safon uh, literary production and its issues? And of course, it's major proponents, of course. Well, uh, like you said, it was extremely controversial. But why was it controversial? It was controversial because of only one thing. Early house writers from 1980 started focusing on romantic relationship. And the reason they focus on romantic relationship is because of the influence of Hindi cinema on, on young people in house areas. So they, they, they tend to write uh, uh, romantic stories. And in house society, Romance is something that is best done quietly. You don't come out into the open and say, I love you. Uh, you don't do that. I mean, you, you'll be surprised. A lot of people are married for years. Hello, Prof. 
Uh, it seems we have been defeated by the internet. Temporarily, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, this issue of uh, literary production is that I remember that Doslin mentioned, um, you know, sort of a Lyon's Francais sort of thing for the Swahili language. Um, does this uh, go all the way to an autography or a script? Is uh, there a particular? Uh, oh, Prof, you're back. Welcome back. Hello, Prof. Oh, dear. Yeah. Okay, so Doslin, um, the, the, the issue of a script, it's particularly controversial because, of course, before the Europeans came to northern Nigeria, we used to use the Arabic script, and uh, it's called Ajami for the Hausa language. Um, yeah. is, that this, is that a similar situation with uh, Swahili? What scripts were it, or, or is Swahili literature uh, written in today and uh, perhaps historically? Uh, when you look at some of the earliest Swahili manuscripts, they were written in Swahili language, but with Arabic script. And that was a similar case, even when you look at the South African part, Africans, the first manuscripts, uh, literary manuscripts in Africans were written in Africans, but with Arabic manuscripts and things like that. And we can argue about that in the context of the whole the Indian Ocean world and the, all these communications that have been happening for centuries between the uh, between uh, all these regions that border the Indian Ocean world but when you're looking at Kiswahili today it has its own orthography and that's a good thing because when uh, we were discussing for example Kenyan literary production uh, using different Kenyan languages one of the shortcomings that we all always come across is that some languages the orthography on most Kenyan languages is not well defined. And if the orthography is not well defined, it means that everybody will have a different script, like there is no standardized script of writing. But fortunately for Kiswahili today, the orthography is very well defined and there is a body that regulates that. What we are adding to this is that uh, the new words or the new languages associated with Kiswahili, that, like Sheng, that are coming in, the orthography is not defined, but that is the whole idea of a language like Sheng. It's not supposed to be confined. It's supposed to exist outside of any government or any form of control. Okay, in that sense, Sheng is resistance, in a sense. It is supposed to be like a counterculture, exists as a counterculture. Countercultural. Okay. Yes. Well, the whole idea back, is, is, is to not confine it. As soon as you think you know Sheng, then the word evolves. <laughs> and the word they use a different word so yeah, as researchers or people that are interested in language you have to be aware of how it exists such that you there's no reason for you to kind of create an orthography or try to confine it and then next week it's going to be something else different it's all changing the ways in which we interact or consume language okay thank you Doslin. welcome back prof Hello, it looks like you're the one who is off because we can't see you. We can only see a blank screen. Oh dear, that's that's serious. <laughs> and I can see all At three least we of can you. hear you. At least we can oh, hear we can, you. No problem. My, what I wanted oh, okay. to say briefly, because I, I, I really have to go because of the prayer time now. Uh, the, I have sent a link to the chat group about Afrophone literature on the internet. So please take time to look at it. It's a conference that is taking place in Germany in February next year, and I'm one of the organizers of the conference. And this issue of language and production is, is, is a very, very critical issue for us because the language now is, is changing its domain and its terrain. It's no longer about writing novels and then going and printing them and then taking them to the censorship board uh, before you distribute them. Now the internet itself is a canvas. There are a lot of sites like uh, Wattpad or even Facebook where people write their novels without any censorship. And uh, it has become organic now. People are writing uh, more spontaneously. So yes, there were in the, the, the house of production at the beginning was, was, was restricted by censorship. But now it is free for all. People have the right to, to write.
Oh dear, the professor has gone off again. Um, and I, I had really wanted to get a final word from him. So um, yeah, so I'll take final word from you. And if he dials back in, then uh, we can take, we can get a final word um, 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 from him. So uh, Munyao, my, my question is this, all right? The, the question of uh, Swahili literature, Hausa literature, is it not in fact a moot conversation? I always try to say this. The language of the future is not going to be Hausa or Swahili. It's going to be coding languages. It's going to be Python. It's going to be CSS sheets. It's going to be whatever the next thing that comes up that they're going to use for artificial intelligence is. So this whole question about languages, which we organize seminars and break our heads about and you know write so much about, is it not in fact a moot question in reality? What is the future of this of this whole thing that we are doing with language? Um, it it is true that the future will have a lot of uh, machine languages, uh, and that will be a very essential part of how humans will, will begin to exist. But I do not um, think personally that um, the development of all these kinds of machine languages will ever uh, comprehensively or completely replace uh, human languages. And while um, a lot of people across the world will have um, access and use to uh, uh, technology. Um, and it will become increasingly the thing that people use to communicate or to do uh, things with. Um, I do not think for, for in any way, and I stand to be corrected, that um, it, they will be replacing human languages. So we might, we might get to see, um, you know, Kiswahili, Hausa, and many other languages evolve to fit in the ways in which um, it, it is used in, in, in uh, addition to the kind of technologies that are going to be coming up, especially um, with, with, uh, with in, in the sense of languages. But um, in a sense, we will um, continue to have these languages um, dominate human communication. And in one of the interesting things that I'm um, we are likely to see is um, a, a sense where you know the, the barriers between the languages is kind of um, uh, done away with because of technology. We might be able to see people being able to instantaneously translate from one language to another, even uh, even you know. At some point, we might see someone speak into a machine, and and the machine automatically translates that to um, to a Husa, and therefore communication between two people, an East African and a West African, becomes possible because of the kind of um, uh, translations that will be enabled by technology. But even with all those things, I think fundamentally we will not be able to lose. Um, um, the human languages as they are spoken today. Okay, thank you very much, Munyao. So, Doslin, you get the final word. Um, in which, in, I, I imagine that the changes have been radical, but in which ways has technology particularly um, changed um, the, the language debate, the language use, the whole issue of language uh, in African uh, literature, particularly from your perspective? And that would be your last word. Thank you. I feel like um, it provides more avenues for the languages to keep growing, adapting, because in the last few years, uh, maybe 20 years ago, the idea was African languages it is in incompatible with technological development of the world. But now, with the example of Kiswahili, for example, we realize that languages, for example, they evolve every day and it's possible for languages like Kiswahili, like Hausa, like Luganda and everything else to kind of adopt new technological languages and things like that. And in addition to the previous question in which you are asking about the future of language, I feel like because of the relationships of all these languages, for example, that are spoken in Africa, they would fit very well in a technological uh, setup 
because it would mean that through technology, people are able to kind of communicate with each other as opposed to one language dying, but embracing the technology as a form of uh, broadening our communications in the region. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Doslin, and thank you very much, uh, Munyao K.